Hi folks, and welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. Unreal Editor for Fortnite is here. UEFN combines the power of Unreal Engine with the scale of Fortnite. Use development tools to build games and experiences unlike anything seen before. Learn more about this and other epic announcements at unrealengine.com slash feed. The Infocom Media Development Authority and the Singapore Games Association are calling all creatives based in Singapore to submit their best pitches for short form content created in Unreal Engine 5. Dive into the details on the feed. In our most recent developer interview, we caught up with Thirdverse. Vice President of US Studios Dax Berg explains how the studio packs in all the action you'd expect from a hero shooter into X8, a VR game where players can enjoy high-speed tactical combat and use hand gestures to activate powerful abilities, and just how Unreal Engine helped them achieve their goals. Unsure of what you want to learn next? Well, you're in luck. Here are some fantastic community tutorials from the Epic Developer community. Ready for your glow up? Applying animation tricks in Unreal Engine 5 can make a big difference. In one of their tutorials, Kaiva takes us through how several tips can be leveraged to add that shine to your real-time environments. You'll have a whole new view of yourself when you're done with this tutorial. Game designer and world builder David Tavares covers the enhanced input system, character blueprints, and the associated camera settings to teach us how to create a character toggle for third and first person views while providing suggestions to continue your learning process. Spaceships, sports cars, and horses, oh my! Fly, dive, and gallop through a Stara's deep dive into creating chaos vehicles and adding them to the sample game Lyra, covering everything from character animation to wheel blur. Moving on to this week's Community Spotlights. 3D artist Jayad Mohammed uses UE5, Megascans, Sketchfab, and the UE Marketplace to help showcase the deep love and pain of a mother's bond, from the brightest lights to the darkest depths of emotions. Watch the full short on their YouTube channel. A pig and a young hero go on an adventure. Play as Keiku, a child tasked with a journey of adventure across a sprawling continent full of strange creatures, ancient ruins, and unique tribes. Navigate the path of mystery in this open-world action-adventure fantasy game from Bingo Bell. Wishlist Keiku, Ancient Seal, on Steam. Be the change you want to see in the world. In their first script-to-screen creation in Unreal Engine 5, CG artist Ashish Shan began this filmmaking process to better understand Unreal Engine's in-depth functionality while polishing their filmmaking, cinematography, and overall CG scales. Originally created for World Water Day 2023, the Blue Treasure conveys a special message about freshwater conservation. Let them know what you think on their YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have an epic week. Hi, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm hosting today, Amanda Shade, as your community lead. Tina is unfortunately not feeling super well, so hopefully she'll be back next week, but please send out all the love and healing and good vibes to her. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be diving in and talking about Unreal Insights. So we've got Ari, Catalan, and JB here to dig into that very um, important topic, even if maybe not so flashy, but do you go around and uh, each introduce yourself? We'll start with Ari. Thank you. Uh, so glad to be on the stream again. Uh, I was just recently on it to talk about mega grants. Um, always way happier to talk about the more technical aspects because that's kind of like, you know, what I like. Um, yeah, an introduction. So hi, uh, I am Ari. I'm an evangelist here at Epic Games, mostly with a programming um, related topic. So I have a programming background. And um, if you are looking at me going like, I think I recognize that dude, it might be because you saw my previous presentation about the same subject we're going to be talking about today uh, mm -hmm. called Maximizing Your Game's Performance in Unreal Engine. And I actually went out of my way to wear the exact same clothes I was wearing in the show. So you should definitely go like, I recognize that person. So yeah. And uh, super excited to be here. And um, also 
just a little bit because people might not know what an evangelist does. It's a really weird name for what we do. I am basically a, um, oh God, so first point of contact for people in Europe. Uh, we have evangelists for each region, so you can check out our website to see who is in your region. And um, developer relations slash going to conference person. <laughs> I like calling you field community. <laughs> field community, yeah. yeah. Field, field, yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, awesome. Um, how about Catalan? Hi, uh, I'm a software engineer on the Unreal Insights team, and uh, I look forward to hopefully show, show you something interesting today. All right, and JB? Hey, I'm uh, Johan Berg, uh, but people call me JB most of the time. Uh, yeah, I'm also a programmer on the Insights team. Um, and uh, yeah, we're happy to be here to show you uh, what we've been working on. And uh, yeah. All right. So do we want to dive in? Sure. I think we should. Uh, so I can start. Uh, so if you haven't heard about Insights before, it's an application that allows you to kind of record from a running game and then analyze uh, performance and memory usage and other stuff. So it's really three major components. It's a library called Tracelog, which is a runtime library, which emits events into a single file, which we call a trace. Uh, there's Unreal Trace Server, which uh, handles uh, re recording and uh, storing of traces. We call it a trace store. And then there's Unreal Insights, uh, which is Kind of the application for analyzing and visualizing traces. So you can see I've started Unreal Insights here, and uh, I wanted to quickly show you how to use it. Um, so I'm using Lyra here as an example game. Um, there's a different, there's a few different ways to start trace, but uh, I'm going to start the game normally uh, without any tracing on. And then I'm going to use a console command to start tracing. So that would be trace.send. And you can see from the, the, the tooltip here, perhaps, that you need to provide a host and a channel set. So the host is localhost, because I'm hosting the trace server here locally. And then I need to uh, provide a, a channel set. So there's many different channels like CPU or log, uh, but uh, we have aliases as well. So we can use um, uh, default as a common set of uh, tracing uh, uh, channels. So now we are tracing. And if we go over to my Unreal Insights here, uh, you will see the, uh, a trace going on here, which is uh, increasing in size and it uh, has this live live icon on it here, showing it we are currently recording this. Uh, so I can use trace uh, stop to stop the trace again. And uh, that would uh, finish the trace file here. So uh, if you want to take a look at what it looks like to analyze data, I can, like in a chef program, I've prepared uh, a sample here, uh, which is uh, also Lyra, uh, but it's a, a slightly longer run. I've started the gameplay as well. So this is the analyzing view of Unreal Insights. Uh, and you can see there is a lot of data. But uh, it's um, I'll go quickly go through the, the different views here and not go too much into detail. But you have this main track here, or main uh, main window which has many tracks. And each track is represents a thread or something else going on. Um, you can also have different types of tracks, uh, which um, can show other things as well. Um, but this is what's happening on the CPU and GPU at, at any moment in the game. Uh, then we have the log view, uh, where we just output all the log events, which can be useful to correlate to different events that's happening in the game. And we have a timers panel. This is basically the same information that we have here, but it's displayed in a table manner instead. 
Uh, and finally, we have the frames overview, uh, which is uh, a, a slightly different way to show, um, show performance data. So here we see the, the frame times uh, represents uh, the height of the bars here. So I can see it. I, I usually have a pretty uh, stable frame rate around 70, 75 frames per second. But there are a few spikes here and there. So you can easily click on a spike. And that will um, uh, highlight the section in the timeline view. And you can press F and you can zoom into that timeline view. You can see here is a, a fairly long frame. So we can try to figure out what's happening. For example, um, so in this case, uh, there was a pipeline state generation. And you can also actually see that this is a bookmark up here that a new PSO was generated here. Uh, but you can also scrub around and find uh, uh, find other types of uh, performance problems in the time, timeline view here. Uh, so that's just um, uh, a brief overview of what the, what the timing insights can do. So you can see up here that uh, we have a tab called timing insights. That's because we only captured timing data in this run. Uh, we also have memory insights, uh, which uh, is tracing uh, all the allocators in the game. So uh, we, we emit events for all allocations and freeze and moves. Uh, so we can basically reconstruct what was happening in the, in the game. Uh, at any time. Uh, so um, we can use that to analyze memory at a specific time, or we can also look at how memory changes over time uh, by different queries. Um, and one of the most recent things we added was uh, metadata tagging for allocations. And that's a kind of a generic way to associate uh, data with different allocations. And we've used this to tag allocations with specific assets. And uh, that's what Ari is going to show now, how we can use that information to find uh, memory problems. Yeah, before we switch Ari? to me, though, um, thank you. I noticed that, yeah, you had that bookmark there that was telling like, oh, unencountered PSO. And uh, it was very descriptive. I wonder, can developers make their own bookmarks for interesting things that are happening in their game at certain times in the program? Absolutely. Um, the, this is just using the regular bookmark macro in, in Unreal. So if you add macros, it will show up here. For example, load levels or yeah, whatever you want, you can instrument your own code. You can also instrument uh, your code with the CPU timers and uh, many other things. Awesome. How about if you have a game that is only blueprint? Can you make that bookmark with a blueprint call? Uh, that's a good question. I think you you can, but uh, you can, I'm you can probably do it with a console command, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can do it from That's a blueprint. True. Yes. Exactly. So you can run console commands from blueprint. I already knew this answer. So I just wanted to like have mm. you say it. But yeah. So you can actually <laughs> in blueprint call a console command to create to create these bookmarks for you. So you don't even have to be like you know only in code. Um, and yes, you did mention the new memory metadata. Uh, and definitely let's switch to my screen so I can show you how that works. Um, usually I like to do my presentations a bit pre-recorded, so a bit more control, but for uh, Unreal Insights, I decided, you know what, let's do it live. Also like, uh, because uh, Portina is sick, um, for a little while, I thought we were gonna have to do it without anyone hosting. So good thing you stepped in, Amanda, because I was gonna go like, oh, us developers are running this whole thing. No no host here to control us. We, I was going for unorganized chaos. But uh, now that you're here, let's try to, let's been, try to keep... You know, like go off the rails and just <laughs> really see fun. what things we could break and yeah. how to... Uh, uh, I mean, you have the perfect tool to figure out what's going wrong. Can you use insights on the exactly. screen to find out where it's exactly. not performant? If we were doing the stream in Unreal Engine, we could, but unfortunately this time we are not. <laughs> so, uh, but let me show you how this new memory tool works. Um, people that saw the previous presentation I made, 
uh, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. Know that I am quite a performance nerd uh, when it comes to this. I really like these things. So when I was seeing these new tools, I was absolutely, I was so excited about them, and I'm so excited to show you all now on the stream. I'm going to start by um, launching Unreal Insights. There we go. I have I have one like backup just in case everything messes up. And then I'm going to start Lyra with Insights. And in this case, uh, this is just a shortcut I made to put in like the trace parameters. You notice that JP was using the command line. Um, uh, it's also quite easy to just make a shortcut like that. And here I have this parameter. And it, in case you can't read it, it says dash trace equals default, memory, metadata, and then asset metadata. You need, uh, for the metadata, you need all three of these. I guess you need the metadata because that's the whole metadata underlying system, right, JB and Catalin? Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. And then asset metadata is one of the types of metadata that we offer. And uh, now that this is running and I just put in the dash trace, I don't need anything else. I can just start Lyra now with insights. And as it's running, this is going to start uh, tracing here live. And uh, let me see. Start the game. So I'm going to run around a little bit. Let's say, uh, so I'm going to show you a few curses, just like I did in my previous presentation. And this is actually the same project that I had in the presentation. So, hey, how nice. I, I've added a new feature here. I added this welcome screen. Isn't that nice? And um, here we have the old load level of volume uh, that was uh, creating the stall. Oh, shit. I mean, didn't mean to say that, sorry about that. Um, and I started loading the map asynchronously and now it's just done loading map. So I'm just gonna close the game now because let's say the QA, they already came to me and said, Ari, 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 and I ask, what is it? And they tell me um, the game is crashing on consoles, something that has a limited memory because it's uh, running out of memory. And it happens when you load that extra level there. And uh, well, I'm going to test it not on console this time. Of course, we should test it on console, but I'm not going to do it here because that's a lot of that's a whole quagmire of NDA stuff. But uh, I'm going to launch it on Windows because if it takes a lot of memory on Windows, it probably uh, on console it will probably take a lot of memory on Windows also. It's like it's Unreal Engine it runs the same on everything mostly. So I'm going to open this uh, trace here by double clicking on it. Um, and it will start putting in the trace. I think it's running much faster than the game was. Is it double the speed? Do you know? sure. Or is it just as fast as the, it can read? On the first page, you have a, 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 on the session tab, you have a little. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Analyzing 1.3 times, times speed. OK. And here we can see a memory spike. This is probably when I started loading the level. So I'm just going to click up here. Uh, if you click and drag, it will put the A marker there. If you have a rule that has uh, like B and C or D something, uh, then you'll get both of them. And when you're done clicking, you can also move A around like this. So I'm just going to put it here at like the top of it. And I'm going to run a query. And this will now give me every single memory allocation that happened. But seeing them like, like this, is that's not really useful. So I am going to. Create a like I could just go with the preset, which is what I did last time. But I think it's going to be more fun if I just show you how many like uh, groupings we could do here. So instead of all, I'm going to change that to uh, one of our two new uh, metadata tags. So now we have package and asset, and that will show us if I click this, for example, it will show us what package something was in for that specific memory allocation for every me memory allocation that happened in the entire game. I think that's absolutely amazing. And I'm going to arrange this by size. And uh, I'm going to, this function here, I don't need this, so I'm going to hide this. You can just right click any of these headers and click height like this. And it goes out of the way. And uh, here we can start seeing some um, assets. And if I expand this, now I can see every single memory allocation that was done for this package. Now we know that in Unreal, each package can have multiple assets. So Instead of like trying to figure that out here, I'm just going to actually add a new group. So I'm going to click this little arrow here. I'm going to do add grouping, and I'm going to do unique values asset. Now I have two groups. That means that it will first sort everything by package. And then if there's multiple assets in these packets, they will 
uh, show up underneath that. So here, for example, we have a mesh, uh, massive canyon, and if I toggle it, expand it like that, you can see everything, every single asset within that package. And then if you expand that, then you get every single allocation. But let's say I want more. Uh, I want to see uh, what tag, what low-level memory tag was after that. So I'm going to add another grouping by, um, let's say, yeah, unique values LLM tag. And now, if I go into this one, now, now we're going to see that most of the memory is coming from static mass serialize, then a few kilobytes, one kilobytes coming from init, init resources, and then scene render. Even then, I'm like, that's not enough info. You can add yet another group. Like, this is totally dynamic. You can do whatever you want with it. And I'm going to add grouping by call stack. So now we have four groupings. Actually, when I was, uh, when we were practicing this, uh, I was showing this to JP, and JP was like, I don't think I've seen anyone do four groupings. Uh, I wonder if this is going to break. And don't worry, it doesn't break. It handles it like Ooh. a champ. Hey. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So now, okay, now we have uh, massive canyons as done. Uh, I think this is the identifier, unless it's called Hoodoo. And uh, here we have the LLM tags. Sorry, now this is the packets. This is the asset. This is its uh, LLM tags. And then you can, I'm clicking the right arrow button now. So you can go like this. You can also right click and uh, expand critical path and it will go all the way down to the memory allocations. So not only can you sort every single memory allocation that happened in the game, almost every, uh, by the packets, and then by the assets, then by the LLM tag, you get the entire call stack of where that memory allocation was allocated. I think I think this is so cool. I don't know if anyone else is nerding out about this as much as I am, but I am like I am flabbergasted. This is amazing. Oh, what what amazing tools we have nowadays. What a great time to be a game developer. <laughs> Anyways, okay, I'm gonna calm down a little bit now. Ah, okay, but we now have to figure out what's going on. We can already see that we have in memory these static meshes, and each of them is humongous, absolutely humongous. This is like uh, one third of a gigabyte. Here's like quarter of a gigabyte and 162 megs. Then we have some noise textures that each of them are humongous. And then here also we have canyons. And uh, then we have uh, the UE logo. Okay, interesting. And sometimes you'll notice that it's not actually in a package, but we, when we do have the packages, we have it, we put in something very descriptive, like here you can see like it's the raw static index buffer, uh, the render hardware interface scratch buffer. So it kind of helps you already, you know, know what it is, even though it's not technically from an asset that came from a package. But I think this, if you saw my previous presentation, you should definitely check out if you haven't. We always tr try to figure out what is the problem first, and then we figure out why Why is it a problem? Why is it happening? And now we figured out the what. We see what is in memory at that time. So there's these static meshes, so a massive canyon. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to just open Unreal and start looking at these assets and try to figure out what is wrong. So let me see. I'm running Unreal of the main branch, which is very unstable, so it might crash. And in that case, it's just going to be super fun and we can all laugh about it uh, while I cry myself to sleep the following night. But uh, I'm going to open the quick open asset window. And you can open this by pressing Control P. And there are other shortcuts for it, but I can't remember any of them. But Control P is at least the one I use. I think is it also, I don't know. If any of you remember, you can say it now. And then I'm going to search for Kenyon. The thing is, it's going to give me a lot of stuff. Uh, sure, like, I, okay, I can see the static messages here, but let's pretend that I didn't see them. Let's say I only saw textures. Uh, just a little extra hint, a little pro tip for you. You can also just write in here static mesh, and it'll filter it by static meshes. Oh, oh, okay. I don't know if anyone else is as wild as I am by this, but you can also put in like a texture, and then it'll only show textures. Static mesh. Okay, so I'm going to open this asset, and this one was allegedly huge according to the uh, memory insights. And it looks like quite a normal texture, but if you look at the numbers here in the upper left corner, you can see it's got two, okay, one shy of two million triangles, a bunch of vertices. <clears throat> I think it's better that I show you this uh, by just switching to wireframe. You can see it's quite dense. Really like whoever put that in there. Ah, no, just joking, it was me. Um, so here we see all the triangles, and this is like, very dense for a mesh. And um, 
one of the reasons for that is I wanted to put something absolutely horrible in a game to show you an example of you know what could go wrong. And uh, I downloaded the highest quality. Actually, I downloaded Nanite quality meshes from Mexicans, and then I turned off Nanite. So no wonder this is humongous. And usually in a game, like this is movie quality assets. This is not what games want. You usually want way fewer triangles than this. Um, but if we go back to uh, 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 this one here, you'll notice that the mesh itself took 174 megabytes, and then the body setup took 172 megabytes. So there's, it's split into two. And for you, for the ones of you that don't know what body setup is, because the LLM tags we can tell here, it's physics. So physics for this uh, asset is taking as much space and memory as the asset itself. And how we can preview it is that like it's, we can go back to lit mode and then I can click show and I'm going to show a uh, simple collision. It didn't really change. So there are no simple collisions. So let me uh, uncheck that and let me show complex collision. And then we can see the problem. I don't know why in a game you would ever need this complex collision for anything really. So yeah this is a problem this is like way too complex collision so, so of course in this case how we would fix it is that we would just enable nanite support that's it so then what it would do is that it would have uh what we call a proxy mesh which is basically the stand-in for until it gets loaded and that's a very simplified mesh that only gets loaded like um by being a hard reference and then everything else gets streamed in because that's what Nanite does, like a texture streaming, like it will just stream in the details of it. But the thing is also the uh, simplified mesh, the, na the Nanite uh, proxy mesh, that also has the collision, not the high definition mesh, but the proxy mesh itself. So the collision gets way easier also. But let's say you're in a situation where you don't have the option of using um, Nanite. Maybe you're exporting to platforms that don't support it. In that case, you can just, um, add some number of LODs and have Unreal automatically do them for you. And um, you can even do LOD stripping so you can take off LOD zero, like don't even ship it. So yeah, that would be how we fix it. Also, one thing that we can do, actually, oh, I shouldn't have closed it, but oh, let's just open it again. Canyon is, I wanna, I wanna know where this uh, Kenyan is being used. Okay, this is a different one, but they're all being used. So uh, I'm just gonna click in here and press Control and B, and that basically goes to where the asset lies in your project. A really handy shortcut. You can, I think you can use it almost every window. Like if you're in here, press Control B, and it goes in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the Reference Viewer. I'm gonna right click and do Reference Viewer. I actually open this so often that I've memorized the shortcut. I've just pressed Alt Shift and R. So you can just Click this and press Alt Shift and R, and then uh, Reference Viewer will open up. And uh, by default, it will usually have Search Reference Depth 1. Uh, so I had a 2 because I was doing this before. And uh, here we can see the mesh, and here we can see you know the material on the textures is loading. But we can also see uh, in which level it is. It's in level underscore huge level. And uh, this level is like, then we can ask why, where, what, where is huge level being loaded in? What is referencing it? So I'm going to. This makes search reference depth two here, so we see a bit more. You can see here that L cursed. Actually, I'm going to open this up. It's going to take a while, and I should have done this in advance, but I didn't. <laughs> so here in L underscore cursed expands, we can see the parent level that is keeping in the blueprint uh, blueprint underscore trigger load sub level, and that has a weak reference to huge level. And just on time. Um, this is, this is why it's fun to do this live. So, okay, now I'm going to use the reference viewer to do a detective work. BB trigger load sub level. I'm going to search it in here. Uh, trigger load sub level. And if you double click it, you can see this is indeed the volume that I walked into uh, when I was showing you the demo. And I can also just click edit here, but you can see here, like here's the reference. It takes a parameter uh, that if you open the blueprint, I can do it right now. Um, it has a property called map, which is just an uh, object. 
And um, I have set it with huge level. So now we know what is referencing it. Now we know why it got loaded in the first place. We have figured out the what and why uh, it's happening. And I showed you also how to fix it by um, doing the LOD or turning on Nanit for the mesh. Uh, that was the first of two curses. I'm going to call them curses because that's what I did in my previous presentation, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. You should check it out if you haven't already. Spam it in the chat, please, if you haven't yet. We can't have it often enough. <laughs> I am now going to say, like uh, all of these, all of these things have been fixed. Figured out why. Uh, I'm glad that everyone who's watching this maybe learned something new. But now we're gonna take a look at these cursed noise textures. I recommend this naming convention. Now, that was something about this in, this in my previous presentation that I noticed there was some pattern. Uh, and um, I'm actually gonna do the same thing. And uh, JB, since I have you here, I actually have a feature request. I would like it, because we have the whole package here, I would like it so that when I right click it, um, can't I just, I would like it to open, and because we have an open in Visual Studio when you have the source code, I would like to open the Visual Studio when we have the package. That's a really good idea. You can, uh, I should really thank do thank that. You. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Uh, 5.3 or something. Okay, so it's called Cursed Noise. So I'm going to go back to Unreal Engine. And I'm going to go Control P. I, I love this. Uh, open asset in your entire project. No need to use that search and have to select the folder. Uh, cursed noise. Here we can see all of them. These are beautiful noise textures. So okay, this is a 4K texture. It's quite big. And I'm going to press um, Control B to see where it is. So we can see there's a folder here called um, textures. And um, there's lots of them. <clears throat> and according to the memory window, all of them are getting loaded. And I want to know why. And I think we're going to we're gonna use exactly the same tool that I just showed you with uh, meshes. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to go to reference viewer like this. And OK. So we can see here, here's the texture, first noise. And it's in a panel called cursed noise panel underscore unused. OK. Unused is a little bit like, hey, like someone marked this as unused. Why is it? Why is it being used? What's happening? And then that is in reference from a widget blueprint called Curse Monitor, and then it's in a cursed screen widget. And if I uh, expand the search reference stuff even more, you can see it's in the cursed expands level. We can actually we can check out the level because it's in a cursed screen widget. So let's actually check out the level. Um, I actually know what widget it is. It's the new one here that I showed you, and I was so proud of it. It says welcome. Isn't that cute? We didn't have that in the original talk, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. Uh, you should check it out if you haven't yet. <laughs> sorry, I'm sounding like a broken record. And um, uh, sorry, I didn't select Our it. new role uh, is going to be sales. Uh, yes. They don't call me evangelist for nothing. So here we have it. I'm going to click the edit button there to see it. And uh, let me go into. No, this is a blueprint. There's no widget here. So, OK, it's got a widget. The widget is, uh, I can't remember how to find it. But we can see it in Reference Viewer. It's uh, using this uh, Chris monitor. So I'm going to edit it here, right there from the Reference Viewer. You can open it right there. I'm going to close these by middle clicking on them. OK, let's see where it references this thing. So uh, I don't see it here. Like, there's an image. There's a common text welcome, and there's a cursed logo. Which is blueprint, but we saw in the reference viewer that it wasn't cursed loco. It was just going straight from screen screen widget to the uh, from cursed monitor. I mean, to the cursed noise panel and used. But it's not it's not being showed here anywhere. This is super what weird. Is it, Why is it in memory? Yeah, yeah. What is it? What is it? Don't worry. I, I actually know it. I'm just pretending not to know. <gasps> so and I yeah, know. So here in the code, there's no code either. Oh. Fascinating. But here we can see there's a variable called subpanels. And if I click it, scroll down a bit, you can see here there's called something called default value, subpanels, one error element, and uh, I've actually increased the screen resolution so you can't really see this, but if I drag this out like this, oh, no. this is the class for widget blueprint cursed noise panel unused. So what it looks like what happened here is that Someone, um, <clears throat> maybe this was there before. 
maybe it was here in designer there was some noise behind it and someone removed it here and maybe there was some code that did something with it and that was also removed but someone forgot to uh clear this reference here in this array so it is being referenced okay so now we know how this is being referenced uh and then well we should check out this cursed noise panel also so uh let's let's click that one and uh, right click and click edit see what's happening how why why does the memory screen look like this why are they all in memory so i'm gonna go uh here and uh look at the designer view there's a noise image there. there's a single image that has the texture set there well there's only one of them so okay maybe something in code so here's the graph and here we can see what's happening so in construct uh we're taking one random texture from all noise images and putting it into the noise image brush so this is now uh, noise two and apparently every time this is constructed the original idea was that it would have a different noise texture this is probably something you would see in the game probably like quite common and then if we go to if we click this array here scroll down you can see here are all the textures being referenced i am still a bit surprised like okay sure sure whatever we're referencing all the textures but Unreal has texture streaming. So why are they all just hanging in memory? They should be like, they should be just not loaded in memory until they are being rendered. And then we show them, right? Isn't that what Unreal promised? Uh, hold your horses, hold your horses. Because if we open this texture, you can actually double click on this. Did you know that? you can double click and open it directly? Oh, amazing. Now you learned that. The reason it's not being streamed in, you can always check it in the textures themselves. Here in the upper right corner, it says method equals not streamed. Ah, because I'll tell you why. It's in the texture group UI. And believe it or not, this is actually on purpose. This is by design and it is working beautifully. And I will explain. UI textures, you don't want them being streamed in because when that happens, you show the UI, like you user presses pause button or the main menu or something like that. And suddenly you get all these blurry textures that then stream in over the course of a few frames. And that looks horrible. And for UI textures, you don't want that. Also, um, streaming is for textures that have mitmaps. And mitmaps is for objects that can be far away and like or close to you or anywhere in between. UI textures do not have that. They are always at you know, the resolution they're supposed to be at, and you don't need the mitch for that. But because of all these reasons, it, we don't stream it. And that, but the thing is, like when you show a UI screen, we, the, all the textures need to be ready. They need to be available. They need to be ready in memory to show when you want to show a crisp noise panel. And uh, we don't know what you're showing or what you're planning to show. Maybe on tick, we might have decided to switch between all these noise images. And you want them all to show up blah, 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 instantly. So we can make decisions for you when to stream them in or not. So by default, every single texture that is not streamed will be loaded into memory and will stay in memory while it is somewhere referenced. And this is actually quite a common thing that I see in games is that um, they will have UI screens that reference other UI screens. And all of these UI screens have UI textures. So that means that if, because of reference hell, you have your main UI HUD referencing anything that could possibly be displayed, you are keeping every single texture that in the UI, in your game, in memory at all times. And how do you fix that? Well, you fix it by loading them on demand, by making this not a class reference, but a soft reference instead. Oh, oh my God, I'm showing you a feature that is a new feature and I didn't know this and uh, I'm sorry, this is in main. I'm, oh, oh my God, this is, but I'm so excited because this has been a giant headache for me. And uh, I think probably this stream will get now quoted because of this new setting. <laughs> Maybe this is already in 5.2. Anyways, you can, change it to soft class references that and then load it on demand uh, when needed or just just before I think Lyra has a just 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 in time loading of its panels you should check out how Lyra does it if I remember correctly um, and uh, I, we have one more thing one more thing to show you 
before I'll set up. And that is because when we were looking at the, was it Chris Monitor? Yeah. We had this local, but if you remember, when I showed you the game in the beginning, there was no unrelenting local there. So this one has actually has had its vis visibility set to collapsed, meaning that it will not show in the game at all. This is like, it's like hidden, but it doesn't even uh, take, take up space. This is usually what you should do if you have something you want to completely hide it. But being collapsed doesn't mean it will not get loaded. And you can see that right here. Here's the texture. Here it's in memory, 64 megabytes. Yeah. So if there's any texture that's being referenced, it will it will it will load because it's a UI texture. This does not apply to game textures. Don't worry about it. If you have a mesh that uh, has a texture, you know, in the material, Unreal would not load it. It will only load the lowest LOD, and then when the camera points towards it or any other hierarchical methods that we use to determine whether it should be shown or not, then we will stream it in. And uh, I think this is also the reason why many people will see streaming pool is over limit because streaming pool is for all textures. I think I'm, okay, I think I'm saying this correctly. I might be talking wrong, but it makes a lot of sense. So I'm gonna say it anyways. Anyway, someone can correct me if, if I'm wrong and you'll see it in the comments down below this video. <laughs> but um, all textures uh, take the say, uh, share the space in the text pool. So if you have every single non-stream texture taking all the space in the streaming pool, and then you start streaming in textures also, then you'll get this warning, hey, the texture streaming pool is you know out of memory. And you should not fix it by increasing the size of the streaming pool. No, no, no. You should fix it by having fewer images in memory at a time. That's it. That's all I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ari. So I'll take uh, over a lot now. Of, lot of good info. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Kevin. Okay, so hi. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to show is a new feature that we developed for uh, the release uh, 5.2. Uh, it is the Insights Editor widget. And it is a widget that enables us to control the trace system uh, directly from the editor. And by control, I mean start trace, stop trace, uh, open traces, uh, toggle channels, and see the status of the trace system also. Uh, JB already showed you at the beginning one way to, to start tracing, which was with the command line parameters. We also have late connect, but now we have this, uh, and also the commands here that you can use in the the console commands, but now we have actually a way to, to do this uh, using the user interface. So for, fortunately, it will be easier to, to use it and to see how, how it's, uh, what it's doing. So let's start. This is like the, the first button, the trace button that opens up the menu with all the options. And as a tooltip, we see that it also notifies us of the current status of the tracing system. So we are currently not tracing. And then we have these new two buttons. We have one that starts tracing and one that uh, uh, saves a snapshot that I'll come back a bit later on. Now to describe the menu a bit, uh, first we have here of the full list of channels, the uh, trace channels that we can see and we can also toggle. Uh, uh, we can do that uh, now when we are not tracing, but also whilst we are tracing, uh, with the exception being these channels that are grayed out, uh, that cannot be, uh, they are uh, it's specific to them, that they cannot be toggled uh, once uh, the editor was starting. So you have to specify them only in, uh, in the command line. Uh, because they, they, their functionality is special and requires data from the beginning of the session. Uh, then we have two options to trace, to add a screenshot and the bookmark to the trace. Uh, we have the stats named events button here, which you can use to control the, uh, if we want to output uh, more events to the, more CPU events to the trace. Uh, and now we're important to have the trace destination. So which is the two options, the trace store and the file. Uh, 
So uh, the tray store, which is the, let's say, the preferred uh, way to do it when you are able, is actually a separate executable. It's uh, called Unreal Tray Server that is launched automatically when you start the editor or when you start the insights. And it handles the recording of the trace. So when you specify tray store, the trace goes to that executable that then stores it to a file. And this uh, way of doing it has some advantages, such as being able to open the traces as uh, live sessions. Uh, and the file, which is uh, the, the most, uh, the other way to do it, which just saves it directly to a file in the project structure. Then we have two buttons again that are uh, corresponding to the two icons. So that's the one that starts trace and one that saves a trace snapshot. And then we have three options. Uh, three persistence options that are uh, helpful options when, for example, you want to always open the session when trace is started and also or to open it when it, you stop trace or just open the file location of the trace when you stop tracing. Uh, Speaking of locations, uh, you can also open the, the trace file locations from here. You can open, here you can see the, the location of the trace store, uh, which is uh, independent of the current project. Uh, and here in pro the profiling directory, if you use the file, so this corresponds to if you are using the trace store option, and if you use the file, you are the trace is going to be saved in the profiling directory. That is project spe specific. Finally, we have a way to open uh, the Unreal uh, Insights uh, browser, session browser, directly from the editor. Uh, this option will also attempt to build insights if it has not already been built. And we have a button to open the live session and another one to view the recent traces. Uh, you can see here a list of the most recent uh, 15 uh, traces from both locations, so from both of these files. Uh, and they are here listed uh, in descending order by uh, by the date that they are uh, they were created. And here you can see that the ones with the house icon represent uh, 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 traces stored in the trace store, and the ones with the file icon represent uh, uh, traces stored uh, as a file, saved as a file. You can click on them to open one, or you can click here to open their containing folder. So now let's see a bit how it works in practice. I am going to leave the trace store uh, as the selected destination, then start tracing. I'm now going to open the, trace, the live session. And you can see here, the tracing has started from a large time stamp because I had the editor open for some time. Uh, and now we can go, for example, and open the uh, Google the CPU channel. And now we can see that the CPU is no longer receiving events, only the GPU events are still being received. Go, we can go and toggle it back on. And we can see that it's they start again. We can trigger start name events. You can see now, now we have more uh, timing events received. Uh, we can run the, the game. Uh, and then we can trace a screenshot and the bookmark. And we'll see here the screenshot and the bookmark. Their names are auto-generated based on the current time and date. And the screenshot, you can see it here and you can also save it from this menu. You can also see here at the recent traces that the last file will be displayed uh, uh, as live because it is still currently being traced. Uh, this button becomes this red color and also has a pulsing animation to easily show you without having to move the mouse over here that uh, we are currently uh, tracing and the tooltip also is specifying that we are tracing to localhost. 
Uh, this uh, will uh, will show up uh, as red and pulsing, regardless of how you start the trace system. So even if you start it from command line or from the console or uh, from a third party uh, tool, uh, it will always show you the correct uh, status of the trace system. So it's very useful to figure out if uh, am I actually tracing somewhere now. Uh, I'm going to stop the trace now. And uh, I can also uh, talk a bit more about the snapshot feature. So by clicking this button, I now save the file with the uh, uh, snapshot. What a snapshot is, we essentially store a buffer in the runtime where we store the latest, uh, th the latest uh, events. Uh, the buffer has a fixed size. And essentially, when you click that button, it dumps that buffer to a file. It's very useful, for example, if you are not tracing, but you have found and encountered the problem, for example, a performance problem, uh, and uh, you would like to save the, the trace uh, to uh, capture the problem, and that way you will, not, you will not have to reproduce it again with tracing active. This is very useful because it saves time and also because you might not be able to reproduce it uh, very easily. So you just click this button, and here, we have a new, it's going to show up uh, as the latest uh, LFS trace. And here you can see that you generally have with these uh, events, we, we have uh, about uh, how much? About 20 seconds of worth of trace in this case. So the last 20 seconds in this case will take. This is highly variable on what timing events you have opened. If you, if stats, for example, were disabled, you would have probably had uh, a few, uh, fewer events and a longer timeline. But it's, uh, it's very good because you can, uh, you can click this button, uh, Rapidly, when you figure out a problem, if you know about it, you don't have to write a command or something else, so you get a much better chance of capturing your problem when you encounter one. Uh, this um, uh, this new widget, so these three buttons here, uh, are uh, implemented in a plugin, the Trace Utilities plugin, that is enabled by default, but should you wish for uh, some reason, you can also disable it. And a few more words about what this system does not do. So the system is only controls the trace from the editor. So uh, it does not, for example, you cannot control the, the trace from uh, running uh, in the standalone game. Uh, to control to the trace from the standalone game, you essentially have to specify the parameters here or late connect uh, or do it another way from the console. But this widget will not work for the standalone game. And it will also not work if you are launching the game on other platforms. Uh, we will be looking into the future into adding support to be able to control these scenarios also. But currently, it is only for the editor and for, of course, when for running the game in editor. Uh, so this is what I wanted to show you first about the uh, about this um, the widget, and I also wanted to show you a bit about a new tool that we developed that allows us to uh, visualize the cooking time of packages. So uh, I already have generated the session because it takes a bit, but essentially I just used the Lyra project. And you can see here the parameters. Uh, I used essentially the default and the cook parameter. Uh, the default one is not necessarily needed. If you use the default one, you are also going to have CPU events, uh, which is, might not be a good idea if your, tra if your cook process takes a lot like uh, hours, because the trace will get extremely large and it will be difficult to work with it. So you can only use only the cook one if, if you want. I already have the trace here, you can see here that, it's, uh, that it has the same parameters that I specified there. And once the analysis is completed, you are going to have this, uh, new, uh, this new panel, the packages panel. Uh, it's important to know that it, it will only show up once analysis is complete. Right, so it will not show uh, intermediate data while it is analyzing, analyzing uh, because uh, we we didn't think it is uh, 
uh, it is very useful in this case to show to show intermediate data. Uh, so here you can see a table that essentially displays all the packages, as long with some information about them. You can see the package ID, and you can see the time it took for certain uh, 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 for this package to the time it took in certain uh, stages of the cooking process. So the loading, the saving, and the two functions that are actually control do the actual cooking, and uh, another function that. Uh, 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 also checks if the if it's already cooked, uh, and we also have the asset class of the package. This is actually the most significant asset in the package. It's class, uh, which we we define using an algorithm. So you can see kind of the the, the system that this uh, this uh, asset package belongs to, and uh, right so, and. Uh, you, we have several presets, right? You can uh, use, for example, it is very similar. So the table has pretty much the same functionality as the one that Ari uh, showed you for memory. It's uh, it's the same system. That's the different data. So we have a preset way to 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 um, to arrange the, the data by uh, the path. It parses the path and uh, it uh, it show it creates uh, group nodes for each uh, entry in the path. So you can see now that they are grouped uh, from the path of the assets, and we also have a grouping by asset class. Where again, you can see now by the asset class which of them um, took uh, and using the sorting. You can again see uh, which of the class took uh, the most time. And then, of course, you can see individual assets, too. Um, we also have the ability in this table, which you can uh, functionally that you can also use for memory. It's actually more developed in the memory table to uh, uh, filter the data in the table using more advanced queries. For example, you see that you have here all the columns, uh, and you can select a column. Then you select the operator. In this case, I want the load time to be greater than, and I just specify 10 milliseconds, for example. And I can add another one. And you can see that between them, there will be an AND operator that you can change here. And you can make it either an AND or an OR. And you can choose another column. And similarly, uh, you can specify uh, a value here. And then when you click OK, it is going to filter and only going to show the packages that correspond to the filtering, the filters that you have chosen. This is very useful when you have a lot of data. This table can easily get into the million entries. And even though the operations will take a bit more time, it can help you a lot to narrow down the, the what you are looking for. You can also we have uh, also string operating to the asset class. You can use something like uh, uh, this to, to also search, for example, for things that get to skeletal things. Uh, which is, uh, you know, if you want to clear the filters, you just delete them from here. And of course, we also have this uh, way to search, which also filters only by, uh, I mean, search, it only searches the hierarchy column, but uh, it uh, also filters and also highlights uh, you what you have searched for. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show you for today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I think one of my, like, I was amazed when I saw that you could filter by string. That means you could also put a package name and like filter every single um, asset yes. based on like what plugin it came from or only from your game or only from the engine. Exactly, exactly. And in the memory, you actually have some, the, the feature is better developed. You have, can, for example, filter by LLM attack. We also have some autocomplete for some fields. So it's better developed there, the, the filtering system. So make sure to try it and to, 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 to give us feedback on it. Yeah. I must say, I'm really excited about the UI because previously, in like previous versions, you had to only use the console 
and that was quite intimidating. And also, like, you didn't know of all the yes. options you had available. You didn't even know what trace towns you had. So you would have to write exactly. to the console. Now trace it helps. To start, to trace it helps stuff. a lot with uh, yeah. discovery. Yeah. Yeah, you have every, You don't even have to check out the doc. Like I keep telling everyone now, oh, you have to check out the documentation to see what trace tells we even have. But no, not anymore. You can just see them all there. And you can toggle them. <laughs> so I didn't know you could do that. You can toggle them on and off while the trace is running. Well, most of them. Some of them were grayed out. But I guess you have to start yes. the game with them to be able to like yes, toggle them on and uh, off. Yes, it's only some specific the thing ones. Is like, yes. Yeah. So by by doing that, you could go to the problem areas of your project. And only then turn on the specific one, so you don't have a humongous trace file. Exactly. You still want exactly. to maybe have some. Exactly. I think it's absolutely it's amazing. Like, all, like... all of these, yeah, ease of use, very user friendly, and like just being able to st start and stop them. Like if you open the editor accidentally, having Unreal Instance running in the background, it'll of course start tracing some uh, default data, which if you don't notice, it can take a while. Uh, a space, I mean, and then having just a little red glow glowing icon in the bottom makes you go like, oh, oops, I, I kept it on, which otherwise you wouldn't have noticed. So just, uh, I think it's amazing. I think we should do UI tools for most of our features that are hidden away in console commands. Of course, I know it's um, a lot of work, but um, this is just how excited I am about it. We also have I have one question. To... Oh, you go Sorry. first. Uh, I want to say we also have plans to improve the uh, a real insight session browser as well to um, add even more ways of connecting and starting traces. Uh, and that includes uh, both uh, like processes on your local machine, but also on consoles and, uh, and even remote machines. So that's something that, that we haven't really talked about, but the, uh, it's perfectly possible to run a, a centralized Unreal Trace server and have people tracing from different machines and collecting all the traces at their central location. Um, so uh, there's many possibilities. Different machines and maybe even different platforms. Oh, yeah. Very exciting. <laughs> well, I have one question. Um, oh, well, let me go first. Let me go first. Um, so you press the button in the UI and you just it just made a screenshot. Can you put a custom name on the screenshots? Like for example, if you're triggering your, them yourself in via console or code or something like that. From, yes, so you can specify, uh, not from the widget. So the widget just has a button and no way to specify the name. Uh, but if you, sp if you trace the screenshot from the code or if you use the console command, which is trace.screenshot, then you can also specify the name. Right. Okay, Amanda, give us some community questions. Well, so first off, I'd like to, you know, from what's been shown today, what is currently available for devs and, um, or are some of these things what they'll be able to, to do once 5.2 releases? That's a good question. Yeah, we've been showing features that are available in 5.1, 5.2, and maybe even coming in 5.3. Maybe good to clarify that. JP, do you want to tackle that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the memory stuff that you showed, uh, most of that is available in 5.2. Uh, but the asset metadata uh, stuff, that is uh, for the next release, 5.3. Um, I think the asset loading insights that uh, Kathleen showed, is also, it, that was shipped in 5.2, right? Yes, so everything I showed is shipped in 5.2. Everything is, and the widget as well, then, yeah. So what yeah, we showed also, today, basically, uh, only the metadata is going to be in 5.3. And also the memory profiling that you're able to profile at all, uh, that's already in, you know, released in 5.1. And you can yeah. actually see an example of me using it in my presentation, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. Put the link in the chat, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's already there, but the metadata, that's new, yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's see. They're asking, does this work for uh, packaged games as well? Uh, yes. Uh, Trace is enabled for development, debug development and test configurations, uh, but uh, you can trace from a package game. That's totally fine. Beautiful. I always love it when the answer is yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Someone is asking, can we 
group and order by source code ref source code reference plus stack trace of the allocation to identify memory leaks. So identify. So what was the last thing? Yeah, uh, but memory. Yeah, leaks? you can. You yeah, you can. You can. Um, I think you can group it by the path, the folder path of the code files themselves, and also by stack trace. I think. Uh, yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's also yeah. important exactly. to know that we have we have some specific queries for memory leaks. So there, in the list of queries, when you select the query, we have some that are specific for memory leaks. You can check their tooltip, and they they will describe what they do. Each. Yeah. yeah. What you can show every the, single allocation show today, as a memory. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> like what our showed today was uh, basically. Uh, what the memory, what all the live allocations at a given point in time uh, were. Uh, but we also have more advanced questions where you can say, I want to know which allocations were added between this and this point in time, or um, which were added here uh, and released after point B and uh, no, sorry. Uh, but there's there's more complicated queries that you can make that. Uh, uh, help you find memory leaks, for example, or other types of behavior. It's actually a great example of showing the, these filters A, B, C, D of finding a memory leak at the end of my presentation, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. <laughs> <laughs> Go watch it. You're it's just the, it's the last repeating one. that in, in your sleep. <laughs> People are going to be watching this. I'm going crazy. <laughs> Um, uh, and the, yeah, there's sort of the general question that this can be used um, for non-games or what are the implications for like video production, but it's anything in Unreal Engine, right? That's like anything you're making in Unreal Engine can benefit from this to optimize or improve the performance of um, the experience in whatever medium that would be. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and yes. I, I think yeah, it's usable both for, uh, you know, um, large studios from, uh, to down to solo developers or hobbyists. Uh, I mean, uh, our, our goal is to make it approachable to, to do performance analysis. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely useful for all types of uh, products from games to virtual production to whatever. Awesome. And yeah. I feel like they just the user interface has leaps and bounds. So hopefully more and more people are using it to figure out where some of their problems may be residing. Um, that one uh, says Unreal Memory Insights for static and skeletal meshes also mentions the size of the serialized method. And they'd like to know what that means. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um... Uh, um, I should say that we develop we develop this tool and the, the the libraries to instrument code, but there's lots of code in Unreal that me and Catalin have no idea how they work, and uh, asset serialization is one of those. But I imagine it has to do with uh, the kind of serialized data in the package that. Uh, when you load it into memory, there's some serialized uh, data around the object. And then there's, the, and generally those are not very large. And then you have larger chunks of data, uh, for example, the like the, the collision meshes and meshes that Ari showed uh, that are usually considerably larger than the serialized data. The good thing about insights is that if you're not truly sure about what some category is, you can just add the call stack grouping and then see exactly what is happening. So you don't have to guess. You see it. You see the code. Beautiful. <laughs> um, I have one question. They're asking if for Katalin. Go for it. Is um, I noticed that the packages window opened up when you uh, do by the the cook statistics, um, but how do you open it if you accidentally close it? Yeah, it's in the menu. So in the in the, it's in menu, the menu, okay. Yes, with all the other windows, you can open it from the menu. Okay, great. All right. Um, 
do you all have, now this is sort of, it's tangential, but do you all have any recommendation for a good rule of thumb for the streaming pool size? Some folks are like, is it half a VRAM, quarter of VRAM? I'm sure it's very dependent on project, but are, are there any guidelines? It is, it is kind of like, like, we have a nice, I think, default size for it. Um, based on like, because you only need to show what's on screen. So it also depends on like the kind of like uh, fidelity that you want the textures to be. Uh, and also which consoles you're putting it out on. So for example, if you put it out on new gen consoles, the ones that are out now, you might want to increase it a little bit from the default. Um, but you should also basically play your game, make sure you don't have too many textures that are not streamed in memory, and just look at the textures and see what the texture manager is trying to do. And if you say like yourself, I actually want, like I'm putting out a 4K game and I want way higher definition textures uh, and the streaming pool is almost uh, is always at its limits, then increase it. But maybe sometimes the texture streaming pool might not even be at its limits. So that just means you don't even need any more. Uh, so I would recommend you just be aware of those numbers. And yeah, like it, it depends. I think the default numbers are quite good. They've been quite good for a long time and I still think they're quite good. Um, but your mileage may vary. All right. Thank you for that in, uh, input. Let's see. Uh, they're asking if they need to deploy the Unreal Trace EXE with their game EXE in order to trigger a trace capture on a remote server. On a remote. Uh, that's a good question. Do they server. need the trace the server, server right? executable? Yeah. No, uh, not trace, necessarily. Trace. You, 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 you want to answer that? Okay. Uh, no, trace is uh, is a library that's linked into the to the game binary. So uh, tracing happens completely from the game process. Um, Unreal Trace Server is a standalone service that we run, you can run on the machine. Um, usually, it's started automatically when you start on Real Insights or when you start uh, the editor, like Kathleen uh, talked about previously. Um, so those are basically the two components you need to be tracing. Uh, the game that's tracing something or on any machine and then uh, on Real Trace Server on some other machine. I also want to clarify a little bit. So when you are tracing from your game, you have two options of how you save this trace. One of them, is that you connect to a trace server. Usually when you open Unreal Insights, the executable, like I did at the start of my demo, that already has its own trace server. So if you start your game like I did, it will automatically connect to Unreal Insights because it's running. The thing is, if Unreal Insights is not running, there's no trace server. So what happens then? Well, you can start a trace from the game and output file as parameter. And that's built into the game binary itself. And then it'll just save it directly to file that you can afterwards open with Unreal Insights, even on another computer. But because it is not going through a trace server, it means that you cannot open it live as it's recording it. So hopefully that clears things up. Beautiful. Thank but you. in short, no, you don't need the executable. Uh, um. <laughs> the short answer. Um, another uh, question. Can you compare traces between different sessions, uh, for example, in a different report? Uh, currently, we, we can't, like, uh, we, we, we only look and load one session in, in uh, in the analyzer, um, we have tools to um, make kind of automated reports and stuff like that. Um, and then you can output um, information about uh, a trace session into another format, like a CSV or something else. And then it might be easier to compare. Um, uh, yeah, but not visually, no. Okay. Just another thing for the list, right? Yep. <laughs> Let's see. Are there ways to get more detailed information for the GPU thread, similar to how Pix or Razor has uh, GPU specific captures? Um, that's really something for the rendering team. Um, 
I'm definitely not an expert on how it's implemented here. So uh, if, if, if they are talking about like more specific uh, like performance data from the GPU, I don't think we have that in trace. Um, and uh, so we, uh, basically we have the, the, the markers that the, uh, tr like the rendering uh, backend provides uh, for us. If that answers your question, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. And then, are there any specific consideration for considerations for VR focused projects and platforms? Uh, they're they're asking, especially when using Insights and Profile GPU. But uh, if there's anything in that realm you have uh, to suggest, feel free. Uh, like tips around capturing, or do you know uh, tips around performance on VR? Uh, given considerations, I would think that'd be closer to performance or um, in that realm, but yeah, because capturing on maybe VR should be, but... yeah, capturing on VR shouldn't be any different from capturing on other platforms. And uh, as for performance, uh, I, I'll leave that to Ari. If you have anything regarding VR, um, just. I mean, it's always the same thing, no matter what platform you're on. Um, if it's slow, you profile, you figure out what is slow, you figure out why it's slow, and then you figure out how to fix it. Um, like, it's the same method of measuring, whether it's VR or not. But there are some tips and tricks that applies to VR that doesn't apply to other games. And unfortunately, I haven't made VR games, so like, I, I don't know about them from the top of my head. Awesome. Well, we'll save that for uh, one of the many VR streams we have with some of our teams. So, uh, but um, yeah, so it sounds like, but generally, as far as using Unreal Insights, it's all it's all the same, regardless of your endpoint, kind of as we mentioned earlier. Let's see. Um, someone suggested, or had, was asking, and this is uh, still sort of in the VR realm, but more specific to Insights. They say, while running Insights for VR, Sometimes you see sections on the threads that are waiting on something like scene preparation before scene rendering, uh, but they're unable to see the details on what it's waiting for. Um, is it possible to see those details to know what the um, scene may be waiting on? Catherine, so I can take can that you... bit, yes. We have a tool, it's called uh, Task Insights. Uh, that uh, when activated, when activating the task channel, will show data in the typing view, including uh, information such as this. It will essentially show the tasks from a task system, and it will show some uh, relations between them, including what uh, uh, tasks are being waited on, on a wait for task events, and a lot of other useful stuff. Uh, Maybe we'll have one as a presentation of the task uh, graph insights. There's quite a lot of good features there also. But generally, yes, we do have the task insights system. You can also search the documentation for it. Perfect. Thank you. That Yeah, that sounds like exactly what they were looking for. Um, let's see. I think that's most of, you know, pretty much wraps up the key questions. Were there other things you all would like to add before we wrap up? Or see if some folks toss in last minute questions. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm going to ask this uh, question even so. Oh, yeah, you go first. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, maybe we um, one thing that we haven't talked about that much either is that um, we built Unreal Insights and uh, the tracing system in a way that you, you could uh, add your own uh, um, tracing. Both tra use the existing events that we have, like the CPU timers, and, and instrument your own data, of course. That's uh, um, a, a really good way to, to uh, get uh, to understand the performance of your own code. But uh, if you have very custom systems in your game we also it's also possible to emit your own events event types and then write a plugin 
to insights where you can analyze those events and visualize them um, in whatever manner you want actually uh, yeah wh whatever fits uh, that data that you have um, so it's a pretty open system in that sense that you can develop your own kind of tracing subsystems um, and that you just uh, slot in into the existing application obviously that that requires a little bit more work but uh, for if you have a custom system and want to uh, you know profile that i think that's a good way forward wonderful what was your question ari maybe a uh, feature request Less. Since I have you on the spot, you know, I love that. Yeah. Um, I think it's what like, it's the difference that makes insights amazing and out of this world. And I think like it's it's really cool to be able to you know play back and you know see all the stacks and stuff. But sometimes um, it begin it can be hard to knowing the context of what's happening, especially if it's from like a a game that you're playing through and the screenshot functionality seems nice but a little limited so i would like to add a feature request that we have maybe even like a low resolution video going alongside the timeline so at any time you could see like what is causing the memory spikes or what is causing the lag uh, that would be awesome so like yeah please as a request as a feature request from me personally well we can't really say no on on a live stream so <laughs> I guess now we have to implement that. We'll take it into consideration. There you go. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Great. Welcome, we'll developers. Consider. This is what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple more questions come through. So they said, um, currently, if you want to use insights to check memory performance, you have to manually enable it by using uh, the dash memory command when launching the program. Is there a uh, more direct way, or are we planning another way to to do that? To I mean, uh, currently uh, there is a we have that limitation that you have to enable it from the start uh, because basically we we capture uh, we capture all the memory events, and if you want to build a complete picture of what's in memory, you need to know all the allocations from the start. Um, otherwise, you will get mm. all, of, all of a sudden you get uh, free events which you don't know about. Um, so, but we have been talking about both uh, allowing uh, memory memory the memory channel to be in, toggled on and off in runtime, but then you would have to accept that your data will be um, inconsistent mm -hmm. or or incomplete. But uh, in some certain scenarios, that might be uh, uh, what you want. Uh, uh, so we have been discussing that. Uh, but also, if um, if if we're talking about how to start, like to start the game with, if it's uh, complicated to start it with command line arguments, then we also have a plan to to better to make it easier to start profiling from Unreal Insights. So uh, we want to have in the future some way of you know starting the game and saying up front I want to profile memory and we can have good uh, presets there uh, when launching the, the the game. So hopefully we'll make that easier as well if that's what they were referring to. Wonderful, thank you. Now this may be related to the question we asked about GPUs earlier, but are you able to get frame details with insights like the ones you can get from RenderDoc with regards to GPU tasks and execution, for example, shaders, or is that kind of the is that still that's something we'd have to check in with the rendering team? Like details around uh, uh, draw calls and stuff like that. Uh, now um, we only have timing information in insights. Uh, so far, at least, uh, um, yeah. It would be quite challenging because you need to take a capture to get these, get this data, and that can take seconds for every frame. And because because of that, there's not real time, so it's not really feasible currently to uh, have that detailed per draw call um, information inside of Insights running at real time. Also, RenderDoc is a great program, so. Um, I mean, 
maybe we should stick to showing the timing stuff and uh, we can use the, the, um, a good program like uh, render doc for for that kind of detail i think as well yeah and also if you don't need all the features of render doc we, we we do also have profile gpu which is a great tool for profiling what happened to the frame quickly and easily within uh unreal uh, for development builds, and you can actually see how to use that in my presentation, maximizing your game's performance in Unreal Engine. <laughs> Sorry, but it's it's true, it's there. Uh, they're asking, can, can we put bookmarks uh, in for custom code traces? Custom, uh, sorry, what? So custom said, code traces? Uh, the core question was, how do we put bookmarks for custom code tracing? Uh, okay. uh, if if you have custom code, you can just uh, insert fb underscore or no sorry fb um, ue underscore bookmark, um, uh, and that will uh, show up as a bookmark in insights. Um, or you can, uh, I guess, issue a console command uh, to set the bookmark as well. Beautiful. Can we breakpoint? from the profiler or insights? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. That's okay. Um, no. I mean, uh, tracing is, uh, is. You can break with the code Sorry. off Unreal Insights because it's just, it's basically an Unreal Engine program which you can run from Visual Studio and you can break there, but that's probably not what you were asking for. And now, I, I, in, in that sense, that uh, like tracing is a one direction um, data stream that comes out from the game into the trace server and then into insights, basically. All right. I think we've gotten through our backlog. I know Ari has a question for himself. <laughs> well, is it in the chat? Maybe you should read it out loud. <laughs> All right. Ari looks so handsome with his gray hair. Is it natural? Why, thank you, random internet person in our chat that I don't know. <laughs> it's a really nice, thoughtful way of asking a question. Um, actually, my hair is natural. Uh, when I joined the game industry, it was completely dark. And now there's like very little dark left in it. This is what it's done and to I don't you. Know what that's, yeah, I don't know what that says about the game industry, but um, I, I, I would not do it again. <laughs> I love that user. Give that user kudos, whoever that is. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I want to say thank you all so much for coming. If there's any last minute pieces of wisdom you'd like to share, please do. Um, but to our to our community, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure having you. And these shows aren't what, you know, these, sh these shows aren't as fun without you. And so you showing up and asking questions is what really makes them something special. Uh, thank you so much to JB, Ari, and Catalin for coming and hanging out with us. Um, this, it's a lot of insights on Unreal Insights, and uh, so it's incredibly ha helpful. Um, please do, I stole that from Sky in chat, so thanks, Sky. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, make sure to watch Arya's, Arya's video, whatever whatever that was, you know. Uh, what was it called again? I can't remember. Well, maybe there's a link in the chat. If not, just add it again, just in case. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm going to you know, get sure Unreal kicked for spamming. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just linked over and over again. Um, make sure to follow us on all the social channels. We're usually at or slash Unreal Engine, wherever you can find us. And yeah, lots of big news last week at GDC. If you haven't checked it out, definitely do as much. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they are purely spamming your, your talk. So there it is. If you had any doubt on where to find it, it is there. They're so, spamming. Any, any other items you'd like to leave the community with for this week? Just want to thank you so much for having us over. It's always great to have a chance to uh, show off these amazing tools. They might not be the sexiest topic, but I enjoy it thoroughly. And I really hope that my enthusiasm kind of is contagious and people get more interested in performance profiling of their game and really investigating why things are wrong uh, and learning because um, it's a really great way of you know making games better. And I'm hoping 
games now will become better on average because we've all shown you how to use these amazing tools. And for all the hard work that JB and Catalan put in to making them. Thank yes, you. thank you for these tools. Thank you, I thank am, you too. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Everyone have a fantastic week. Thank you again for showing up to hang out with us. And we'll see you next week on Inside Unreal. Bye.